um, you know, we are really worried humanity about uh, the the fact that we are running out of fossil of uh, sorry fossil fuels. Um, but that's not our main problem, right? Our main problem is to really replace this uh, all the all the materials that we are surrounded for. Yeah. Yes, because we have technology to replace the fuels part of fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. um, we have solar energy, nuclear energy, water energy. There is ways to get electricity. There's way to keep ways to keep cars going and houses heated without oil. We need to scale up that technology, obviously, but it exists. What doesn't exist is a way to replace petrochemicals. Mm -hmm. And that goes deeper than most people realize, because most people, when you say petrochemicals, they think of plastics. Yeah. That's obviously something that we do get from oil, but it's also every damn thing that surrounds you comes from indirectly or directly from petrochemicals. And that includes food, the, the agriculture, the way we do it right now to support the billions of people that we have on Earth would not be possible without fertilizers. That's that are point. based on compounds that come from oil. Yeah. So it's a much bigger problem than most people realize when we talk about replacing oil. I love the chase and the hunt and I set the pace when I'm running. I always take what I want and I always give it 100. Don't need a bank, no, I'm funded. Play the game like it's nothing. I'm always thankful for something. Don't take for granted, stay humble. So, welcome, uh, Kate. How are you? Welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm great. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you here. I mean, I, I'll, I'm always fascinated with interesting people like you. So you're based in Minnesota right now, right? Yes, I am. Cool. The land of snow and cold. Yeah. So you basically uh, start, you are a biochemist, right? And you basically work in a lab where you are uh, creating synthetic cells, right? That's that's yes. the main idea that I got from after looking into your profile and everything. Um, you studied in Poland, right? Because you are actually Polish. Yes, I'm Polish by birth and I did my undergrad degree at the University of Warsaw. Cool. Yeah, because, you know, Marta is Polish also, so that's that's cool. She's from Dansk, from the north, right? Welcome, yeah. fellow, fellow Paul. <laughs> Hello. We're everywhere. We're spreading. Yeah, yep. I know. And I was also about to say that you you live in Minnesota right now, which is full of snow, but Poland used to be full of snow and it was full of rain. So <laughs> the yes. atmosphere is quite similar. <laughs> yeah, okay. So I let's... grew up with beautiful winters, yeah. Oh, nice. Uh, I was in Poland last week and I, I it was always snowy and it was really interesting for me because I, I am based in Spain and I'm Spanish and, you know, it was hard for me to adapt, but it was really nice. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, let's go straight to the point. Um, you know, I don't want for our listeners and for ourselves to really get lost in the forest. Uh, and I would like us to assume what we understand what a synthetic cell is, although we later in the interview will delve into that. But I would like to just assume that we uh, assume that synthetic cells are non-natural cells, artificial cells. Um, whenever I study a subject, I, I'm also interested first and foremost in the application fields that synthetic cells uh, or any other thing that I study is uh, intended for. So let's start with that, if you agree, Kate. Uh, yeah, I was, I was researching a little bit of on the application for synthetic cells. And one of the things that uh, uh, drew, drew my attention the most is that uh, synthetic cells can help us to uh, replace uh, petrochemicals, right? Whenever we are talking about, uh, you know, we are really worried humanity about uh, the the fact that we are running out of fossil, of, uh, sorry, fossil fuels. Um, but that's not our main problem, right? Our main problem is to really replace this, uh, all, the, all the materials that we are surrounded for, yeah? Yes, because we have technology to replace the fuels part of fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. um, we have solar energy, nuclear energy, water energy. There is ways to get electricity. There's way to keep, ways to keep cars going and houses heated without oil. We need to scale up that technology, obviously, but it exists. What doesn't exist is a way to replace petrochemicals. Mm -hmm. And that goes deeper than most people realize because most people, when you say petrochemicals, they think of plastics. Yeah. And that's obviously something that we do get from oil. But it's also every damn thing that surrounds you comes from indirectly or directly from petrochemicals. And that includes food. The, the 
agriculture the way we do it right now to support the billions of people that we have on earth would not be possible without fertilizers That's that a fair are point. based on compounds that come from oil. Yeah. So it's a much bigger problem than most people realize when we talk about replacing oil. Yeah. So how, how does synthetic cells help in this area? So to replace oil, we need to find ways to make petrochemicals with biology, with something renewable. And mm. the thing about petrochemicals is that they're very toxic. Um, that's why oil spills are such a big deal. That's why petrochemical industry is such a big pollutant, because those chemicals are inherently very toxic. So no self-respecting natural bacteria or yeast will make those chemicals for you because they'll mm. just drop dead if you ask them to make it. Okay. And the way to get around it is to design the entire metabolism around the need to make a particular chemical. So for example, if I want to make benzene, which is a very toxic chemical, I need to design a whole metabolism around the fact that I need to make benzene. And mm. you cannot do that with natural cells because you can't design them. They're natural, they exist, they're very complex. You can't build them from scratch to do what you want them to do. And that's where synthetic cells come in. Um, they allow you to make something from scratch and design that whole metabolism around the needs that you have. And that's why that could possibly be the way to replace petrochemicals is by making them in cells that were designed specifically to make those chemicals. Okay, but I have a one question. Like you mentioned that uh, we cannot make natural cells. Like, well, I mean, like they cannot uh, make uh, petrochemicals because they will die, right? That's my understanding. But yes. uh, can we actually fool uh, natural cells into doing whatever we want or it's just very complex and that's why we are researching into this field? No, we can't. Natural cells are too smart for us. They, mm. they first and foremost, they want to stay alive. Natural yeah. cells, first order of business is to stay alive. And then, then if it has any resources left, it will make what you ask it to make as long as it's not too toxic. And that's actually the biggest problem in this whole field of metabolic engineering. That's what it's called when people try to make natural cells make products for them. It's not designing the pathway in itself, so designing the way to make the compound. It's convincing the natural cells to actually do that. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I, if I want to make a particular drug, I can easily design a genes that will make that drug for me. But it's really difficult to find a strain of bacteria or yeast or, or mammalian cells that will actually accept that pathway and make the drug for me. And okay. that's, it, that's difficult because natural cells are very complex and we don't really understand them. They're very particular, right? Okay. So is yes, that- they're fussy. <laughs> they're fussy. <laughs> is that the, then, then when we run out of fossil fuels, if we, is, is our only way to replace uh, or to replace the world as we understand it uh, right now? That's... Yeah, if we, yes, if we want to keep the world looking like it does right now. So if we want to have as many people as we have on the planet right now, if we want to be able to feed them and clothe them and produce medicine, electronics, we have to make those petrochemicals somehow. And, you know, one way would be to find some processes, chemical processes that will give you those chemicals from simpler building blocks. Mm. But all of that requires solvent and requires a lot of energy. Mm. Biology does growth and manufacturing, basically synthesizing compounds for a living. So a lot of people believe that it would be much easier to replace that petrochemicals with the so-called bioeconomy. So mm. making things with biology because biology grows. I mean, Biology can grow just mm. using sunlight and CO2. Mm -hmm. And if we can make a natural organism that's going to be making the compounds that we need, it's going to be much easier and most of all, much cleaner. We're not going to have any waste because it's all done with biology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, that just only because of that, this subject is really fascinating because it's just like uh, our future, as we understand it, depends on basically on it right that's that's very but that's very cool um, um how far are we actually from achieving this goal are we talking like months years or it's hard to tell definitely years probably decades to the point when we really could scale it up because there are two different problems really one is we need to make it possible at all and that's probably a decade or so away but then there is another much bigger problem, and that is scale it up. Because right now we're using just billions of tons of those chemicals, and it's not easy to scale up bioreactors like that. So there's this whole industry that needs to be developed 
and not just for petrochemicals, but for a lot of um, parts of the chemical industry that we're right now doing in a non-sustainable way. There's a lot of things that need to be developed that will allow us to make those chemicals at this huge scale that we need to really maintain life. Mm -hmm. Let's go one step uh, back because uh, you mentioned like uh, natural cells when whenever they we try them to make uh, certain compounds or something like they naturally they die right because they are alive. So my first question is like an easy one. So what what is life? What what makes a cell alive? <laughs> That is a fascinating and very difficult question. Um, there are many definitions of life and there's no good definition of life. Mm. Um, any definition of life that you give me, I can show you an example of life that doesn't fit that definition or example of something that you would agree is dead as a doornail that fits your definition of life. So that okay. shows you how incredibly difficult it is to make a definition of life. Um, there is a commonly used definition of life that was developed uh, by NASA for missions, for um, life exploration missions. Mm -hmm. And that is a self-replicating -replic system capable of Darwinian evolution. Okay. And that's a good working definition. But according to that definition, neither of us on this call is alive because neither of us is self-replicating. Like I mm -hmm. cannot self-replicate. You cannot self-replicate. We Can need at least two humans to make a new human. So yeah. every definition of life has exceptions. And yeah. so I can't really tell you what life is, which is kind of funny because I'm in the business of making life, but I yeah. don't have a good definition of life. That's very interesting. Like, that reminds me of my school times when we were taught that viruses were not alive, right? For instance, like, but maybe yes. it depends on the eye of, of the beholder, right? Like, I think viruses are not alive themselves, but they're part of a biosphere. Because you cannot have a virus without a living organism that will replicate that virus for you. Okay. So viruses are about as alive as to me as the microphone in front of you. Mm -hmm. Because the microphone in front of you is not alive by itself, but it wouldn't exist if we didn't have life that made it. Mm. Um, yeah. Basically, mm -hmm. that microphone wouldn't exist on a dead planet. That microphone only is possible because we have life in a form of humans that made it. And mm. to me, viruses are in the same category, even mm. though it sounds kind of funny, is they're not alive by themselves, but they're made by life. Mm. I know you work in astrobiology related to stuff also. Um, one, one thing that we know for sure in, on Earth is that uh, everything, everything that we know alive is made of cells, right? But uh, yes. is, it, is it like, is it possible that if we ever encounter any other kind of uh, way of life in you know in the universe eventually like would it be based also on cells or is that the most likely thing or or it doesn't necessarily have to be like that it doesn't necessarily have to be based on cells but we have pretty good evidence from kind of theoretical studies of life that most self-respecting lives should be based on cells just because the way evolution works if we agree that life as we know it should be capable of changing and adapting to the environment, that means it has to be capable of evolution. Mm -hmm. And to be able to evolve, you need to have individuality. And mm -hmm. that individuality means that you have your own genes or whatever way you pass information on. And then there are neighbors that are different from you. And that's mm -hmm. what a cell is. It's this way to give life individuality that there is you and there's not you. And that's only possible if you enclose your biochemical reactions and your information molecules in some compartment, and that's a cell. So that's a very strong argument that a lot of people in the field make, and I agree with, that if we find extraterrestrial life, it will be some sort of a cell-based or individual-based life. They don't have to be lipid cells like our cell. They could be completely different compartments, but there will be some sort of a little, little vessels that mm -hmm. are separate from each other. Yeah. So, so basically they, they, they will have membranes, right? Membranes there, like membranes or something else, you know, it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be a membrane. You can yeah. imagine life that's based on mineral compartments mm -hmm. or peptide compartments. They don't have to be membranes. I, I think there'll be membranes because lipids are perfect for the job and we know their lipids the lipids exist elsewhere in the universe. Those molecules exist and they're easy to make. So my, I 
would bet some money on lipids, mm -hmm. but they don't have to be lipids. Yeah. So I, a long time ago, I read a book by Richard Dawkins. Maybe you have read it. It's called The Self Gene, The Selfish yes. Gene. And one of the things that I understood from reading the book is that uh, basically we humans or any multicellular organism is just like a vehicle, a car for the genes. Yes. And the actual life, the actual life in the universe is the genes, right? Or the cells or, yes. I don't know. The yeah. information that con that is contained in those genes. Yeah, so that's fascinating. Yeah, so so talking about this uh, astrobiology thing, so how can synthetic cells help uh, in col colonizing the space eventually? Um, in two general ways. Um, one is that by making synthetic cells, we'll be able to predict how life could grow elsewhere in the universe. Um, so mm. right now, we only know what happens if life gets to grow on Earth, because we're it. If we want to know, for example, how life could look on Europa or on Enceladus or on Mars, we need to try to recreate that evolution under those particular conditions in the lab, because that will actually tell us what kind of life forms are possible under those conditions. And then when we go out there looking for life, we'll know what to look for, because we can't look for a bacteria. If we go to Mars and find a bacteria, then we know we contaminated Mars, which we probably did anyway, because we crashed so much hardware on Mars by now. Mm. But we probably have not contaminated Europa or Enceladus yet or other bodies in the solar system. So going there looking for life, we need to know what to look for. And that's what synthetic cell research helps us to do. And then more practical way is if we want to send humans to Mars. You know, we all probably watched this movie where a guy goes to Mars and grows potatoes. Yeah, that's Mandema. not going to be. Yes, <laughs> that's not going to be possible. There is no way to grow potatoes on Mars right now. And mostly because Martian soil, the so-called regolith, would not support plant vegetation. We actually have studies that show that. But we need to make compounds. I mean, he wasn't growing potatoes because he wanted French fries. He was growing potatoes because he needed nutrients. Mm -hmm. And the best way to make nutrients is to make them with, again, organism that's designed to live under conditions under which you're going to culture it. And Terrestrial organisms are designed to grow in Earth soil in, at certain concentrations of molecules, pH, partial pressure. All of that is very fine-tuned for organisms on Earth. If you want to go to Mars and make molecules on demand, you need a way that lets you be, program it fast and make whatever molecules you want on a very short notice. And that's only possible if you have this manufacturing or biomanufacturing platform that's very designable. So one day you decide we need this nutrient or this drug. You set up your re reactor and next morning you come and get your product. That's the timeline that we need. You cannot do that with living organisms mm. because they're much harder to design. They're much harder to program. But with synthetic cells, you can. It basically the timeline from synthesizing the gene using like a small benchtop DNA synthesizer to make the gene that we need to actually getting the protein out of it is about six hours with synthetic cells. So it's possible to imagine that if an astronaut gets sick and decides, okay, I need this particular small molecule drug, you can design that pathway and make the drug within hours instead of days, mm. like it would be with natural cells. And so that's kind of at the subject of this field called astropharmacy, where people try to make on-demand biomanufacturing solutions for space exploration. Super and fascinating. The really cool thing, mm -hmm. Yeah, the, you know, the, the coolest thing about it, though, is not just Mars. Obviously, I, I would be super excited once humans get to Mars, but mm. there are many applications on Earth where we also need that. There are many countries that don't have very well-developed medical system. Mm. And so being able to make drugs on-demand, on short notice, in a very cheap way, is going to be very useful before we even send Elon Musk to Mars. It's going to be very mm -hmm. useful here right now on Earth. And that's a driving force for that research too. Yeah, yeah so, that's so, actually amazing. That's, that sounds very like um, yeah, sci-fi, but in a good way. <laughs> like, uh, yes. Also, um, I'm wondering because I was really bad in chemistry, a bit better in biology, but I remember from classes that the living cell had a bunch of different elements inside. One I remember was mitochondria, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> but yeah. how does one make a synthetic cell? Is it that you kind of remove things that you don't don't need from the cell? Like how does the process actually work for people like me who are not really great in science? Um, there are two ways you can do it. One is, as you mentioned, remove things you don't need. So you take a living cell, complex living cell, and start taking stuff out of it. 
until it becomes simple enough that you can totally understand it. And that's called top-down approach. Top-down because you're starting at the very top with a complex cell, make it simpler, simpler, simpler. And then the other approach is the so-called bottom-up, where you take things that are not living, but are very well understood. So every single molecule that built, that makes a cell is purified separately, and we know exactly what it is. And then we put it together, and we're hoping that one day it will become a complex cell. And that, that's what's called bottom-up approach. And ideally, those two approaches meet in the middle, and we'll end up with a synthetic cell that's fully living and fully engineerable and understandable. And how long does it take usually to like, let's say, farm this synthetic cell? Are we talking about minutes or hours or days? Uh, that depends on uh, what you count as prep. Um, to make all the molecules ready, that takes days because that mm -hmm. takes a lot of purification, a lot of preparation steps. But once you have all the components in front of you, it takes minutes to actually build the cell itself. Okay, and then so it takes about 10 years to get trained to be able to do that. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> When I first uh, started to research, into, well, to research, quote unquote, but to look into this subject, like I thought that uh, synthetic cells were not, uh, did not have any natural component, like they were made of, you know, like silicone or something, but no, now. Uh, no, they're made entirely of natural components. Yeah. So what you're saying is basically they are simplification in most of the cases, right, of natural cells or. Because yes. it's because it's easier to control, right? It's easier to yes. to know what they're doing. Okay. That it's easier sense. to figure out what's exactly going on inside that cell if you made it. Yeah. And when you study when you work with them, you work with them in isolation, or it's just all you also have to work with them with in groups, or how does that work? Uh, no one works in isolation anymore. The era of brilliant lone researchers is long gone. Mm -hmm. We're all working teams mm -hmm. and Ideally, we work in teams that are bigger than a single lab. That's mm. another big thing that I'm really passionate about is the international community, the community of people that work on engineering synthetic cells has to work together. Is and that, so it's, is that the be a sorry to interrupt, is that the be cell community that you uh, Yes, that's the build a cell. That's the organization that I help running. And that's basically the goal of it is that we all should be working together because everyone has different ideas and we should combine those ideas. We should not repeat each other's mistakes. I mean, I make a ton of mistakes. That the mm -hmm. way to spread information in science, the most common way is to publish. So publish papers. But you don't publish experiments that fail. But every time an experiment fails, you learn something. Mm -hmm. And so organizations like Build a Cell are there so we can share those failures that we cannot publish. Because when I fail in experiments, I learn that something is impossible. I can't publish it because no journal will publish it, but I can tell my friends about it so they don't have to spend time repeating that experiment and making all the same mistakes that I already made. So that basically helps the science move faster. Mm. Okay, um, so come, going back to the application fields, like uh, so far, the, the importance of synthetic cells is far far bigger than what I expected because like so far we've, We've talked about internally on the earth to be able to sustain the way of living that we have, like synthetic cells since the only way to go. And then if something major happens here, we'll have to colonize the space eventually, like if humanity wants to survive. So synthetic cells, again, is, is uh, paramount of a paramount importance, right? So the question is, like, you know, when we are studying other fields like atoms or, you know, quantum physics or whatever, like we devote great amounts of money and around the globe, like for instance, the Grand Collider, right? And is, is it happening the same for synthetic cells or how does? Um, the one difference between our fields and physics and astronomy is that we don't need a single apparatus that's as expensive as a Hadron Collider or a space telescope. You know, you cannot do astronomy without those ginormous space telescopes. And you cannot do high energy particle physics without those Hadron Colliders. And they cost billions to build. So they mm. have to be built in one place and then the whole world uses them. Synthetic cell work is more spread out. It's not as centralized mm. because the equipment that you need to actually make a synthetic cell is not that expensive. Um, there are those community bio labs, the biohacker movement where people make experiments in their own garages and they can make synthetic cells in their own garages. Like it's possible mm. to build a lab that allows you to make very simple synthetic cells 
relatively cheaply. So what we need is resources to actually do that research, to hire people, to buy reagents. But it's not a problem that can be solved with a single investment in one place. It has to go mm. to this whole international community. Yeah, but that so does... kind of a different, more spread out model. Yeah. So let me rephrase the question. So is it is it being given the same importance as these other huge projects? Uh, bearing in mind that for our future is really important, this synthetic yeah. cells field? Not yet, because the field is still new. Um, it's mm. only been about 10 years that we've been aware of the fact that we actually can build life from scratch. Uh, mm. Before that, people were thinking that we have, it would be nice to do that, but it's absolutely impossible. I mean, you can't build life from scratch. It's you, you're nuts to try to do that. And now the science progressed enough to the point that we can actually say, yes, we can do it. So there is a lot of investment in that area, but there needs to be much more. And that's part of what Build a Cell is doing is we're knocking on doors, we're talking to the lawmakers, people that actually control the money, and trying to advocate for the fact that synthetic biology as a whole field needs more investment. And it's working. Mm. Um, you know, I, I know best the environment here in the United States and the European Union investments, and they both are investing quite a bit in this area. Mm. Um, just last month, um, the uh, uh, the U.S. president, the White House, issued so-called executive order. They're basically like uh, kind of like laws that the president can issue here in the U.S. And there was one on bioeconomy specifically. There was specifically an executive order on bioeconomy that highlights why this is important and why we as a nation have to invest in it. And I also know that the European Union is investing quite a bit in those synthetic biology programs. Okay, so they are acknowledging the fact that it's really a huge uh, subject. Mm. Yes, and, and other um, countries are following. That's good. That's good because it's so yeah, it's so promising uh, from all the things you told us already. Um, you mentioned that the field is quite like fairly new, um, and you've been studying chemistry and synthetic organic chem sustain sus uh, synthetic organic chemistry. Whoa, English, um, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, how did you get specifically to the field? Were you inspired by one of your professors or, yeah, I don't know how common this path is nowadays after, you know, somebody studies chemistry, but if you could tell us a, a little bit of a background. Um, I, first I was a chemist and I got really interested in the origin of life because I thought it's just cool. It's inherently cool. I want to study how life started on earth. Uh, so that was my grad school. Both of my PhD, I had two PhD advisors and they're both origin of life researchers. And then, you know, I spent insanely long time in grad school. I was just kind of comfortable in grad school. So I stayed grad student for way longer than it was good for me. But um, I was comfortable and I was happy doing that research. And it's a fascinating question. It's like this fundamental curiosity question, how life started. But after a few years of working in that area, I realized that what I'm doing is inherently fascinating, but it's not actually useful. Like when my mom is asking me, what is it good for? My answer is, you know, it's cool. It's we're curious about how life started, but there's never going to be a drag out of it. There's never going to be something mm -hmm. that's actually going to make a regular person's life better. So then I decided I want to learn how to do useful research. And, but I still wanted to do something fascinating. So I went and did my postdoctoral training in a neurobiology lab. Um, so, you know, figuring out how brain works is another of those fascinating um, foundational science questions, but it is very useful, very applicable. So during my postdoc, I learned a lot about synthetic biology, but I also learned that neurobiology is very competitive. There's a lot of money in it, but there's also a lot of wonderful people with big egos that are very competitive. And mm. I'm generally more friendly than competitive. I like talking about my ideas. I like fields that are more collaborative than competitive. And so that's how I gravitated towards the synthetic cell research, because it combines this fascinating curiosity question, how life works, how life started. Can we make life in the lab? It's inherently useful. It has those giant practical applications. But because it's a relatively new field, it's still friendly. People want to talk to you. People are friendly about their, their research, friendly about sharing their research. And so that's um, kind of how I ended up in this field is it's a good balance between something that's reasonably competitive and high impact, but still friendly and still 
an emerging field where you can kind of, a, you know, I'm a very junior PI. I, I'm still pre-tenured and yet I manage to work with build a cell. I work with the biggest people in our field because it's still a relatively new field and it's, mm-hmm. but they're just nice people. But you seem like a person that is interested in a lot of fascinating questions. Like, is this your main line of research or do you have other lines of research in your work? That's definitely the main one. Um, is just the pure engineering of the synthetic cells. Um, other stuff that we're doing is engineer is kind of rela- related to it. For example, we're doing engineering of ribosome. So ribosome is that enzyme that makes proteins. Every mm. cell, every living cell on Earth has ribosomes. And the ribosome, despite it being the most conserved biological enzyme, it's actually a terrible catalyst. It's Why? not a real catalyst. It's an entropy mm. trap. It's a form of a chemical catalyst, but it's not a true catalyst. It did not evolve in 4 billion years. The catalytic site, the the actual part of the ribosome that catalyzes peptide bond formation, did not evolve since last universal common ancestor. And that's stupid. And that's kind of a driving force for our research is we want to evolve that molecule that makes all the proteins. We want to make it into a kind of a universal biological assembler. We basically want to be able to make other biopolymers using something that's based on a ribosome. So that's we're doing a lot of work in that area. But are we saying that and ribosomes, we, sorry to interrupt, are we saying that ribosomes yeah. are really, really very inefficient? Yes, they're very inefficient. They're incredibly slow catalysts. Um, ribosome, human ribosome catalyzes about 10 peptide bond formations per second. In a biological reaction time scale, that's ridiculous. You know, mm. most enzymes catalyze thousands, hundreds, thousands to millions transitions per second. Mm. Ribosome takes 10. Come on, that's stupid. Oh, really? <laughs> that's, that's very inefficient. That's... And there are theories why it's like that, um, but it's definitely possible to change it. And so that's what we're doing. We're trying to speed up the ribosome to make it more efficient to make it possible to do things with ribosome that natural ribosome doesn't do. Uh, I mean, so ribosomes have been sneaking their way through history, right? No one was looking at them and they've been doing their own thing, right? <laughs> That's what I understand. Okay. I mean, so... the whole life is based on ribosomes, but it's just very difficult to evolve them. Okay. I get it. Also, another field that I saw uh, that is applicable for synthetic cells is uh, biocomputers or something like that. Yes. Can you explain a little bit? Um, yeah, so we're working on biocomputing as well. And so the idea is that we would like to be able to and to interface computers with biology. Um, you know, some people have this fantasy that we'll have implantable computers one day. We're not going to have to carry a cell phone. Elon Musk, just... for sure, right? <laughs> Yes. Um, but then there are obviously more practical and sane applications like prosthetics. We'll, we would like to be able to have people that have prosthetic limbs controlled by their own brains. In order to do that, we have to interface computation systems with biology. And the difficult thing about it is that the way we do computation right now, which is with silica devices, mm. that creates scarring in biology. So if you try to implant, for example, a microchip into a mouse brain, which people were trying to do, the brain scars, create scar tissue around your implant mm. because the implant is hard. I mean, literally it's hard, it's a piece of silica. So it's not possible to do long-term implants like that. And what's possible is to interface goo with goo. I mean, interface biology with biology. So in, let's, instead of implanting computational devices made of silica, let's implant a computational device made of biology. The problem with it, though, is natural cells, like we talked about manufacturing earlier, natural cells have their own ideas about what they want to do in life. And to, in order to do faithful computation, you cannot first go on, make my own living proteins and replicate, and then if I have time, I'll make your logic gate operations. You have to only do what you're programmed to do. And natural cells won't do that because they want to live. So that's where synthetic cells come in. We build them specifically to do computation. So we're building those synthetic cells with, ge- with genetic circuits that do computation, just like uh, silica devices do. But all they do is that computation. There's no endogenous genes that are making the cell very complex. Oh, wait, and so, so we can- Sorry to interrupt, sorry, because I wanted to understand. Uh, no, please do. 
Yeah. So, so you are basically saying that we can create synthetic cells that can simulate like electronic circuits or even like at the lower level, like, cause I'm, I have an electronics background also, like, are we saying that we can create like logical gates or things like that, or even transistors yes. or simulating transistors with this? So where we are right now with synthetic cells is we can make uh, Boolean logic gates in really? We can we can layer we can definitely make all the normal uh, all the basic Boolean logic games. But using the organelles of the cell. It, yes, using the cells, and then we can layer those or those logic gates. So we've seen circuits that are three to four logic gates. Like for example, oh. in my lab, we made a NAND gate from two different NAND gates, universal NAND gates, that then create an OR gate together. Wow. So we can do this logic gate operation. Um, in order for it to actually be useful, we have to layer it more. So we have to get to the point where we actually make transistors. We're not there yet, but that's where the okay. research is going. Well, that's fascinating. Wow, Jesus Christ. This, this, it uh, works. It's really fun. <laughs> this interview is really blowing my mind. It's more than what I thought. Yeah, That's cool. <laughs> it's really fun area. Um, there is a lot of people that work on this biological computation because they want to interface it with biology but they also want to make computers that are capable of healing. You know, when we talk about space exploration, um, we're sending those probes to Mars and we just saw recently that one died. When an electronic device breaks down, you either have to come and fix it or it's just mm. dead forever. No, no. If we are able to do biocomputing, the one thing that biology can do that electronics cannot do is healing. If something breaks, there are repair mechanisms that help you overcome that problem you know when an animal gets sick the animal can eventually heal i mean it could also drop dead but there's a chance to heal and that's one big advantage of biocomputing systems is that we can imagine biocomputing systems have more robustness so not just like a, a silica electronic device that when it breaks it's dead a biological computing device could have healing capacity so if we send it, for example, as a long-term space probe, if something goes wrong in one part of the device, you could imagine you have specialized cells that go in and fix it. But and I'm that's not, something that's possible with biology. But not only that, maybe like maybe I'm saying nonsense here, but uh, I know that electronics in the space are really very, you know, very special because they have to be designed specifically to counteract uh, radiation in the space. Uh, yes. So maybe maybe synthetic cells are more resilient to this factor because they are not alive that's right? another thing yeah that's another thing that we're we're designing around is you can design around radiation exposure um it's possible to build biological systems that have some radiation resistance and that's you know one of the things that people in our field are doing is trying to make sure that those systems are more robust mm -hmm. that makes sense yeah well uh I've touched uh, some application fields, but I'm sure I'm, I've left uh, some others. Like, do you want to mention another ones that you think are cool? Everything's cool in our Yeah, well, I'm the coolest. I'm obviously biased, but the one, one field that I see a lot of promise that's going to real, be realized pretty soon because we're already moving in that direction is medicine, um, personalized mm. medicine. So right now when we make drugs, we make those drugs for huge populations of patients. So for example, I'm making a drug that's gonna cure one form of cancer, it's a small molecule drug, it's gonna work on millions of patients, but every patient is different. Every patient should have really medicine that's personalized for that particular person. And that would be possible to do if you're able to truly personalize what you're injecting into that patient. And so there is actually work right now on using synthetic cells as medicine as those injectable little bioreactors that you put into a patient and they respond to a very specific need of that particular patient. And that's something that's already in animal trial stages. So, you know, we can hope that the drugs will start hitting the market within the decade. And that's going to be a real breakthrough because that's going to truly enable personalized medicine. And I'm really fascinated about it because hopefully that's going to help us cure some of the uh, diseases that right now we cannot cure. We interviewed mm -hmm. uh, recently Peter Ward, uh, well, a reporter that has written a book on immortality. And yeah, I mean, like he, we should put you in contact with him because for his <laughs> next book, <laughs> because he, I think that's interesting for him, like uh, how to achieve not immortality, but how to cure many things that kill us today, like with this new field. 
that's the dream. Yeah, yeah I there's a lot that's of right. diseases that we should be able to cure by now and we still can't. Mm, yeah, but actually it's now when you talk about medicine and how that it's not personalized what kind of medicines you get and how many of whatever you you get prescribed it's actually insane like when i used to live in the uk no offense to uk but whenever you're sick you get paracetamol like two two tablets you're gonna be fine and it's like i think this is just a the cherry on the top of a cake of how unpersonalized medicine treatment can be but uh, i guess this is probably an extreme but it's very fascinating what you're mentioning that there is hope that we're gonna get it a bit more personalized and can you also tell us a little bit about Mm, if you can think about like the milestone you achieved so far in your career like what was it and also maybe what is your like ultimate dream what would you like to do in your career the ultimate dream is to see an actual living synthetic cell created from non-living components Mm. that would be fascinating that would be this milestone that yes we created life in the lab that would be the dream and i think for me personally the biggest achievement professionally was that I get to have that's that's a dream that be able to be a professor and run my own research group that's that's just fascinating that's I'm incredibly lucky there was a lot of lucky coincidences that ended up resulting in the fact that I get to be a PI and run my own lab but that's definitely the one thing that I professionally have to say is the biggest achievement is to create that research group because no one does research by themselves my all my research is done by people in my lab and they really deserve all the credit because they're actually the people at the bench that pipe it. And that's real privilege to be able to do that. Can synthetic cells do evolution like natural cells? Uh, yes, they can do evolution, but not like natural cells yet. Um, they can evolve, but it's a kind of a more artificial process. We have to introduce the mutations that we want them to acquire. They don't spontaneously develop mutations mm. yet. So that's it's good and bad that they do. Okay, so that's so that's like a I don't know the the word, but that's a mystery still for 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 this field, right? How evolution yes. evolves, right? We would like the natural evolution to jump start at some point, but right now it's all artificial evolution. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, yeah. if I was taught this in chemistry and biology classes in high school, I think I would change path honestly. <laughs> <laughs> you were when mentioning we were in high yeah. school that wasn't a thing yet oh uh true mm, yeah true <laughs> no, that's funny because you. that's another thing that i'm yeah go ahead i'm sorry just a delay just so, go on so go on kate sorry I was, just um, to... I was just replying to what marcus was saying um that's one of the things that i'm and other people within build cell are working on we want to teach this to kids we want people that are thinking about scientific path scientific careers to be aware of this field because they are at the point when they can choose what they're working on. And I really would like people to know that this research exists and they can do it. Yeah, and no, I was only going to mention that we had a conversation, Marta and I, like recently, we were talking about chemistry precisely. And she was, I think she was saying that she didn't like it. Uh, well, we were talking about how things are taught in school and university and everything. Like, And that's why I started this interview, like, talking about application fields because many times education is just, you know, they go into details, into the very nitty details and they, you never see the forest because of the trees. Right. And that's why many people get let down when saying something. Right. So that's I think sad that's because science is so fascinating and it's taught in just absurd way. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. It's very, and that's all it's over the world. intimidating. Mm. Yeah. Could yes. Be. It's, yeah, so uh, I think there. Are, I remember some stuff. I I remember that I preferred biology. I don't know, maybe because it was a bit more. I could actually understand it more because chemistry for me, we didn't have enough, you know, lab exercises. Everything was just on a blackboard, and for me, it was just super intimidating. Even though, like, if I sit on it, I can actually understand, but I couldn't see, you know, the fascinating future of it. But now we talk to you, and it's like it's obvious that you know, ten years later, or. Um, some like somehow it's like so many possibilities and i think you're totally right that it's it's really good to let's use the word infect <laughs> young minds with yes. the idea what can actually do with science and that there were so many really exciting things going on um so yeah and i think you're doing a good job because you're very um excited <laughs> about the field <laughs> and we can feel the energy Thank from you, you too so <laughs> you know you touched yeah. on something really important too is um this accessibility 
and intimidation. A lot of people think that you have to be brilliant to go to science. And that's not yeah. true. I'm not a genius. Most people that I work with are not geniuses. We're just, most of us are hardworking people, but we're not special in any way. Everyone who's smart and curious can go into sciences. Uh, I think there is a lot of kind of this myth that scientists are those brilliant geniuses that solve problems by just looking at a whiteboard. Mm. That's not true. On their own, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And oh, yeah. I think it's, it's really important to make people realize that everyone can be a scientist. You don't have to be particularly brilliant or particularly uh, have aptitude in one particular area. You can find areas of research that you can work on. Like people think they have to be good at math to be scientists, and that's mm. not true. You mm. don't have to be good at math. You don't have to be good at physics. You can find area of science that you're going to explore, even if you're not good at all of science. By the way, do you find more men or women in your field? It's a pretty even mix, actually. Um, we are in the corner of synthetic biology is pretty evenly distributed by gender. Um, some areas are still very men heavy, like physics, for example. But in synthetic biology, there is a, a pretty good, especially in our generation, like among my friends, there is about as many men as women mm. running labs. What's a normal work day for you? Like. Uh, that very much depends on what I'm doing. Um, I still work in the lab myself. So I, a lot of the time during the day I have meetings and then in the, in the afternoon I go to the lab. Um, I do a lot of, I spend a lot of time meeting with people in my lab. Um, there's also a lot of writing. Um, one thing about that I love about my work days is that a lot of the time it's up to me when I work. So I get to do things in the middle of the day mm. because I can. Like I get mm. to, you know, go to the doctor, go shopping in the middle of the day where places are empty. And then I catch up on work in the evening because I can. And that's mm. a really good thing about science is almost anyone who works as a bench scientist has this ability to work on their own schedule. And that makes your life much easier. It, it makes running a family much easier because you get to basically make your own schedule. That's true. Like everybody who's listening, who thinks about being a scientist, guys, Flexible schedule, working on great things in life. Awesome. Very cool. Um, are you also teaching by any chance or doing any sort of yes. seminars? Yeah. Yes, I teach undergrads and I'm, I'm really happy about that, that I get to have contact with students. And I also do outreach. I do public lectures and I love doing that. Yeah, I'm going to ask you another easy question. Like whenever I talk to interesting like people like you, like, people that are really wondering about the big questions of life. I uh, always want to hear what they think. So I, I want to ask you, why do you think we are here? And wh what do you think is the meaning of life, if any? I don't think there is any specific meaning of life. Okay. I don't think there's any reason why we're here. Okay. I'm, I'm not a deterministic mm -hmm. kind of person. I think life just happens in the universe. That's what chemistry does. Okay. And I don't think that there is any particular deep meaning. I think basically the meaning of life is what you make out of it. Okay. And I think about that all the time. It's the reason I'm doing what I'm doing is because I want to do it. And I find it cool. I'm curious about it. And I also want to make things that will help other people. And that's the meaning of life to me. But I don't think there is a universal meaning of life. That yeah. might sound kind of sad, but that's no i mean it's a it's a first answer i mean like i i don't know what to think sometimes i think that that might be i mean I, i'm not talking about religion obviously i'm not that religious person but uh whenever we talk about what is life what is what is life right it's just a question is mind-blowing because it, what what makes a a set of organelles or set of materia uh be aware of themselves and replicate and everything right that's fascinating so um, the last technical question I want to ask you is just what are the outstanding big milestones that this field needs to achieve uh, in the short term? Uh, the biggest one right now is to make synthetic cells that can autonomously make copies of themselves. So essentially mm -hmm. self-replicate because we can replicate synthetic cells, but they don't do it on their own. They don't one day just decide I'm making a daughter cell. They don't. We have to convince them to do that. So introducing that self-replication is a really big milestone. 
Um, then another big milestone would be to be able to scale up that technology. So really make those giant bioreactors that make a lot of compounds using synthetic cells. And then another one is to kind of build a whole infrastructure around it. We want to be able to train people, train students that are specifically focused on our field. It's still a new field, so we don't have that. I mean, you mentioned like, when you mentioned that cells, like, sorry, synthetic cells are a simplification of natural cells. And eventually, is it possible that we go to a computer and generate automatically synthetic cells, like in, in mass production? That's the dream. That's okay. the hope mm. is we'll be able to design them on the computer and then they will have automated ways of making them. Mm -hmm. And is it possible, like the, the same way we, as this field evolves, will we ever see a human made of, an, an artificial human made of artificial cells or is it just that science fiction? Right? I don't think a human will be made of the synthetic cells. It's humans are too complex. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think when we start making synthetic cells that will start moving towards being multicellular, mm. it will be something completely different than the life forms that we know mm. from okay, the let me, current let, biosphere. Let, let me let me rephrase that question then. So when we are able to make something multicellular synthetic synthetically, will it be aware eventually? <laughs> I don't know. I Is hope it... not. Okay. <laughs> I That's I scary. hope not, but I don't know. It's it's really hard for me to define what that awareness is. Yeah. You know, it's like with AI, mm -hmm. people are discussing if is AI really self-aware or not? Mm. Is it possible to make AI self-aware? And I'm not an expert in that area, so I really don't know how would that yeah. look like. Yeah. I'm mm -hmm. just going too far. But yeah, I mean, like to me, <laughs> this all sounds like a science fiction, so I'm just trying to push the thing. <laughs> You're pushing it far. Um you I also love mentioned science fiction. But yeah yeah i yeah. uh, also mentioned maybe on the slightly science fiction a bit worrisome topic you mentioned that uh, some people currently are able to in the garage sort of build some very simple synthetic cells is there any risk in this that people will be able to produce them in a cheap manner and they're not good quality enough like is there any black market opportunity here or <laughs> no really <laughs> Um, right now, there's not really a black market opportunity because there's very few actual market opportunities. We were not there yet to the point when we can make a lot of money in this in this field, mm. uh, which is probably why everyone's still friendly with each other. But the uh, citizen science movement definitely has risks and people are doing things like cloning their own bacteria, cloning their own yeast, making experiments mm. in their own community biolabs. And there's definitely risks associated with it. And that's why it's really important that this movement is developing with safety in mind. You know, mm -hmm. it's great that people have access to those tools and can play with biology, but they have to keep in mind that it has to be done safely. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of work that people are doing now in keeping kind of a rules and procedures in place that will keep those, those people that do experiments on their own safe. Mm -hmm. Um, we talk about, we mentioned Elon Musk, uh, I think a couple of times in the interview, because he is also another interesting guy, like doing uh, really cool things. One of the companies that he's involved in is um, Neuralink, I think. Um, yeah. As far as I understand, they're trying to, you know, put, uh, to create implants on brains. Um, yes. As you were mentioning before, like implants in general are really harsh to the brain or whatever organ. So is there any... Do you know if if is there any relationship between his company and and the, this research field, or has he ever tried? As far as I know, what they're doing what they're doing is purely um, bionic implants, so electronic implants with some polymers that can mimic tissues, but not mm -hmm. truly biocomputing implants. Okay. Um, one day, hopefully, we'll see the synthetic genetic circuits uh, being used in implants, but it's not there yet. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I just well, I was just curious because I now maybe maybe Elon Musk should yeah. listen to this podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Like I would thing. rather not. I, uh, no. I like that our field doesn't have crazy people. <laughs> yeah, that's fair that's, enough. Well, it sounds to... very friendly and nice. Like no egos in your field. Let's keep it this way. No offense. No offense to Elon Musk. But <laughs> well, we have to meet the way. guy. He he he's doing things right. That's. Uh... <laughs> 
yeah. the time will show like if they are very beneficial beneficial mm. or the opposite we'll see for now he's crashing yes. twitter for for good or bad we <laughs> shall see it too yes. Um, okay. Is there anything you learned the hard way in your career? Like it could be an experiment that failed really badly, but you learned a lot or something else. Oh, there's many experiments that fail. Most experiments fail, actually. Um, the biggest thing that I think I learned the hardest way is that you just have to keep trying. If something fails, that doesn't mean you you're done. That just means you have to go back and keep trying and keep trying. And finally, it will work or you will learn exactly why it didn't work and you move on to something else that works. But that persistence is something, you know, I'm, I'm a very impatient person and I want to see results now. And mm -hmm. if they don't happen, I'm very tempted to just say, screw it, I'm moving on. But that's mm -hmm. not how science can work. You have to be patient and persistent. And that's, that's something that I did learn eventually, but it took me a while. Yeah, that's uh, I'm not I'm not a very patient person either, so I can relate. <laughs> it's sometimes very hard to wait for the results, if, especially when you care a lot about something. Um, and what is something that you learned recently and that could be anything? I think the last three years really made me realize how important is are the soft skills in science. Um, you know, we went through the pandemic and that affected research, not just in the material ways, not just like that we have problems with supply chain, with reagents, but most of all, there's this human factor is people get stressed, people get burned out, people need support. And that's a great thing about our community is that everyone's really friendly. And I think that's something that we really need to remember is that science is just done by people. And there are people that have their own lives and those lives have problems that are not just as easy as, oh, my experiment didn't work. People go mm -hmm. through their own stuff and we have to be as researchers and especially people that that manage science have to be really conscious of that that we have humans working on it so we we need to make sure that this environment is supportive friendly and we actually give people support so they can succeed that always was important but especially the last pandemic years really showed mm. how important it is yeah that's very true i think pedro has the last question that we usually ask. Oh, really? Pedro, go for it. <laughs> um, Yours. So if you could give an advice to the audience on life, not on synthetic cells, but on life, what would, what would it be? I, I think the biggest piece of advice that I could give is do something that makes you happy. Mm -hmm. Either it's a job or a hobby or a family that finds something that makes you happy. Um, there's a lot of people that think they just have to work all the time to, to make as much money and they don't really think about what is that makes them happy. And I think a balance is really important. I, I love my job and I spend a lot of time working, but I also really love my family and my friends and things that I do outside of science that are, I think everyone should have things that make them happy that, you know, not everyone can have a job that makes them happy. I realize that's not always possible. But there has to be something in your day that you're looking forward to. Because, I mean, we're all humans. We all need something. And you were asking, is there a meaning of life? I and mean, I don't think there's one universal meaning of life, but I think everyone should at least try to keep themselves and people around them happy as much as we can. Yeah. I know it's super difficult, especially recently, but trying to do that is something that's really important. Yeah, it's a mindset, I think. Yeah, mm, you have to find yes, your own definitely. happiness. Well, definitely. I think we've reached to the end of our program. I mean, I really enjoy it. I, I really mean it. Like, uh, it's fascinating to talk to people working on such pioneer fields. And I hope you enjoy it also. And well, I hope you ha have a good Christmas uh, and Thank New, you. Year, New Year's Eve. And yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I hope we can host you eventually in the future when. You discover more things and <laughs> thank you so much and merry christmas to you too and thanks it was really fun to talk i really like how you went all the way from useful to great fundamental questions that was a lot of fun yeah it was easy with uh, someone like you okay so have a good day and <laughs> thank you Goodbye. thank you too bye
bye bye I love the chase and the hunt and I set the pace when I'm running I always take what I want and I always give it 100 don't need a bank no I'm funded play the game like it's nothing I'm always thankful for something don't take for granted stay humble now wake up it's time to look at the enemy look in the mirror if he is no friend to me it's not working now maybe it's the chemistry